Good evening, dear members. Today we have with us renowned surgeon from Bangalore, uh, Dr. Lakshman, sir. Uh, welcome to you, sir. Thank sir, we will be covering and continuing the session on basics of laparoscopy uh, today. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, laparoscopy, honestly, is a postgraduate subject, but I think I mentioned it the last time when I started this uh, uh, first part of the two-part series. I mentioned that uh, it's no harm if you know a few basics about uh, laparoscopy, even as an undergraduate. And in this group, I'm also told that there are a few postgraduates attending, and I thought it would serve them well if they understood the very basic concepts in uh, laparoscopy. We had covered a lot of ground regarding the instrumentation, the basic limitations like hand-eye coordination, the fulcrum effect and so many other aspects of uh, laparoscopic surgery. Today, we'll be continuing the same process and we begin with uh, one of the other challenges in laparoscopy, which is uh, hemostasis. Uh, in open surgery, you have uh, the luxury of a big incision. You can have more and more retractors, more and more assistants, pull the tissues apart, create a lot of space for yourself dissect more to find the source of the bleeding and uh, stop the bleeding effectively. There are several challenges in laparoscopy. These include limited space, lack of retraction, presence of blood takes away the light. And so your visual acuity or the efficiency with which you can see the tissues comes down. You know, it's much less with the so-called three chip camera compared to the single chip camera, which we started with several years ago. But nevertheless, presence of blood in the peritoneal cavity or whichever cavity you're operating in can reduce the visibility of the tissues. And of course, you have a very limited set of uh, instruments, but to make up for all these deficiencies, we now have very good coagulation and energy sources. We will be talking a bit about it in the subsequent slides, but still, the predominant advantage or the method that a laparoscopic surgeon uses is pressure. You, know, you can actually use the organ that you have mobilized or even an omentum to put pressure on the source of bleeding. The important thing is to keep it pressed for at least three minutes by the clock. I mean it. Most of us have the tendency to press for a few seconds and take it out and see what happens. No bleeding will stop with such a short uh, exhibition of pressure. It has to be minimum three or even five minutes by the clock. And you find that many bleeders, including from significant vessels like a cystic artery, for example, or an appendicular artery, will slop, stop by itself. You can also have a gauze piece put into the abdomen through um, one of the 10 mm ports. And then you can use that to wipe off some of the minor oozes that may occur. I will talk about the energy sources in the, in the subsequent slide. There are roles for hemostatic agents, clips and ties and suturing. I keep saying again and again that while I may discuss this with you, this is not particularly an undergraduate subject. The advent of laparoscopy and the challenge of hemostasis that came with it have given us a better armamentarium as far as the energy sources are concerned. Uh, the unipolar coagulation is something we all know. Uh, I, I don't see many people here, uh, so it's difficult to make it a little interactive, but I think uh, Kishan and uh, Vijay can yourself participate because it's always more interesting if somebody is asked and answering questions. Uh, Vijay, if I may ask you, what do you think would be the problems with unipolar coagulation in laparoscopy? Please unmute yourself and see. Oh, maybe you're not around. So we'll leave the questioning part of it. Unipolar. Sure, sir. Sorry, did you hear me? I'm not really sure, sir. You're not sure. Okay. Uh, see, uh, unipolar oh, coagulation. Sorry. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Kishara, sir. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You want to take polar cautery, sir. There may be a transmission of uh, coagulation to the from through the port, and uh, there may be some damage to the intestine 
Correct. Very happy with the unipolar coagulation. That's Correct. what they said. Yeah, yeah, very true. See, you need to have nicely uh, insulated instruments. You see the black covering over this instrument that I'm showing. I'm showing actually a bipolar cautery, but this is the insulation. And many times with repeated use, insulation may go. And in, in laparoscopy, you're seeing a very small area, a narrow area, and there may be areas where you're touching other, other organs. And if the insulation of the instrument is gone, then you may be burning something else simultaneously, which you may not even see. And so the damage to the bowel and things like that uh, can be quite significant. And so unipolar coagulation is something while we use it, uh, it must be used with great care. You must check that the instruments are okay and that you also zoom back with your camera and make sure that there is nothing that is touching between the port, uh, the port at the abdominal wall and the instrument coming through that and the target area, which, which may be you know, the liver bed or the pelvis or wherever. But to overcome that, you can use bipolar coagulation, which is very nice. And you know, you know that the current here passes just between the two, um, two lips, if you want to call it that, the two, uh, the tips of the the two blades of your bipolar cautery instrument. And so, the collateral damage with current passing elsewhere is practically eliminated, completely eliminated. But the problem with both bipolar coagulation is that it's a bit slow compared to unipolar. You need to be a lot more uh, patient. And you can't really uh, cut with the bipolar coagulation per se. I'll talk uh, a little bit more about it when we come to the uh, sophisticated version of bipolar, which is this ligashu. But generally what happens is that you take more time in coagulating the tissue. You take the bipolar out and put another unipolar instrument in and cut that area that has been coagulated. That is a time consuming process. Of course, there are other tricks. You can put another port and use scissors through another uh, port altogether. And your assistant can cut for you the areas where you have coagulated. But that has its own disadvantage that you may have to use one more port and you have to depend on your assistant to do the actual cutting. So these are things which we learn to live with as we keep doing laparoscopy. The, these are trade names, NSEAL and LIGA shoes. These are basically sophisticated bipolar instruments. Uh, the sophistication is in two parts. One of them is that it, it incorporates a sensor which can assess the resistance that the tissue gives to the passage of current. A simple principle. What happens is that a uh, live tissue with blood vessels, with its, with its uh, water content, gives a degree of resistance to the passage of current. Whereas a coagulated tissue, which is desiccated and dehydrated, there's no water content of the tissue, will give a different kind of resistance. And the sensor can sense that. And so what happens is that when you actually ligate a tissue in addition to ligation, it also tells you, the instrument gives you an audible, a little beep sound, which tells you that the tissue is completely coagulated. Now, that facility is not there in bipolar coagulation. It's a visual thing. You have to keep seeing and see if it's coagulated. If it looks coagulated to you, it's fine. If you overdo it, you may char the tissue. Unnecessary coagulation. But here, you can be very precise. When the resistance of the tissue changes as the tissue gets coagulated, the surgeon gets a, an audible signal, a beep, and you can stop coagulating. And most of these instruments also incorporate a blade in it. And if you just push the blade across through a lever that is provided at the handle, then you can actually cut the tissue also. So it makes the process a little faster and a little neater. And another nice thing is the so-called ultrasonic scission, which is the harmonic scalpel. That's another trade name. It is basically, it uses ultrasound as its uh, principle and it, it between the two blades, the, there is such a rapid vibration, several thousand times per second of vibration that it actually coagulates and cuts the tissue. And that's another very nice uh, uh, invention, if you want to call it that. We have worked through various phases before we had all these instruments where we used to laboriously coagulated with either unipolar or bipolar coagulation and then cut it again. 
we find that these newer things have really made life very easy for the surgeon as well as efficient in terms of hemostasis and may has made the procedure faster. It should also be remembered that harmonic scalpel does not coagulate vessels more than four millimeters. If you have something bigger than that, for example, the inferior mesenteric artery or something equivalent, which up to seven mm, you can safely coagulate and cut with the ligature or the end seal mechanism. All right. The next challenge that we have with uh, with uh, laparoscopy is tissue approximation. Uh, I have I see two more names, so I'll have to involve them. Please unmute yourself, uh, Tushar and Kiran. Yeah, Tushar, can you can you tell me? What is this challenge I'm talking about? Tissue approximation in laparoscopy. Uh, suturing technique, sir. Okay. Where are the? Where do you think you will need to do? Is it only suturing, or can there be anything else? Would it include coagulation also, or, or hemostasis? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It would include that also. Okay. Can you yes. give me one or two examples of what those situations are? Anastomosis. Anastomosis. That's an extreme example. Something simpler than that? Okay. Uh, I talked about vessels which are 7 mm, which can be coagulated with uh, um, ligature. Suppose you don't have a ligature, you have only harmonic or only bipolar, and okay, you sir. want to ligate the inferior centric artery or the azygous vein. What would you do? Uh, go for clipping, sir. Okay, clip is not very safe. I'm not comfortable. There isn't enough space for putting double clips on both sides. Uh, you can tie it. Yes, sir. So that is that is also tissue approximation. Yes, sir. Okay. You can yeah. ligation, ligation with a suture. Or you can actually stitch tissues together with actual suturing with needle and you know, uh, that is another way of tissue approximation. Anastomosis, as you said, rightly, is a method. Anything else short of an anastomosis that you would think of in, in surgery where you may want to approximate tissues? Uh, Pexy, sir. Yes, fixation. Excellent, excellent. Anything else? Lots of it. You know, there are so many examples. You may want to suture the stump of an appendix. You will suture the vaginal wall from the from the pelvic side in case of a vaginal total laparoscopic hysterectomy. If you've done a subtotal cholecystectomy, for example, where you might deliberately have left a bit of stump behind, okay, in a, in a merisius syndrome or a very bad gallbladder with an impacted stone in the infundibulum, you may want to suture the remnant of the gallbladder that you have left behind. So there are various examples that you can use, but tissue approximation is a challenge. Laparoscopic suturing is a challenge, but not an insurmountable one. Okay, it needs a bit of training. And once you're trained, it's a very neat technique. Okay, so I talked about knotting and suturing. The knotting can be done outside the body and the knot can be pushed in to effect closure or tissue approximation, or you can actually do the knotting inside the body, a process called intracarporeal. And quite rightly, you mentioned about clips. Clips can be used on small areas, you know, three millimeters, four millimeters, seven millimeters. But if you have something bigger, you need staplers. Okay, for example, if you want to uh, approximate the hilum of the lung after a pneumonectomy, thoracoscopic pneumonectomy, you need to use a stapler. Some of the other blood vessels will need staplers. I'm talking about examples other than anastomosis and anastomosis of course is the commonest area where you would do use a stapler you can also use things like tissue adhesives can, can you name a tissue adhesive glues as they are otherwise called cyanoacrylate oh. cyanoacrylate any any biological thing cyanoacrylate is synthetic fibrin glue okay you also have what's called a fibrin glue these can be used as tissue adhesives. Laser welding is approximation with the use of laser as an energy source. 
extracorporeal knotting is something that you use with one of these two, a thing called rotors, a thing called melzers. Please note that this is primarily aimed at uh, the postgraduates of this gathering. Uh, as I said, it does no harm for undergraduates to just know about these things. But if you do not know about these things, if you do not understand it, it is not held against you. Please let me make that very, very clear. Rotors is a knot that you fashion outside the body and push it in. Uh, it is used in sutures which have good friction. For example, silk or uh, vicryl and things like that. Whereas Melzer's is something that you have to uh, use when there is a very smooth monofilament suture like polypropylene or nylon because you have more throws to give you a better hold. If you put rotors on very smooth uh, sutures like polypropylene, the knot may slip. I'm just, just sort of interest. I'm showing you a demo of how uh, a rotors is done. Okay. You first note that this thread has gone from the outside to the inside of the body. It is looped around a structure. Here it is a hook at the bottom end. You have two throws to secure the knot and on the vertical side, you put another two throws. Now you can see that it, it can actually slip down nicely like that. So from the outside of the body, it slips down onto the structure. The commonest structures that you use it on are cystic duct, the base of the appendix or a tube or something like that. So what you have to do is learn and practice it on the outside. And you can use these on sutures with reasonable friction. Whereas on sutures with very little friction, smooth ones, you do the melzers. Here, instead of two throws, you take three throws beginning and on the vertical side, again, instead of, uh, yeah, you take two throws again on the vertical side and instead of one locking suture, you have a double locking suture. Okay, just watch that. That is the going around the verticals of the sutures and this is the first of the two locking throws that you have. And then once you do that, okay, I should have put another one, but I haven't. So you have to put another throw on that. And with the double locking, you can have a more secure knot there. Okay, that is a Melzer's. Now, suturing is a, a demanding skill, but can be learned with experience. And I always keep telling my postgraduate fellows who come and work with us, practice it in the skill lab and then come on to the patient. Because if you haven't practiced it in the lab, you will take an abnormally long time and you can also cause damage because that skill hand-eye coordination must be good. The important thing is you have the scooping between one and seven o'clock. What I mean is that your starting must be at the one o'clock position up there. And when it comes down, you have it at lower down, right, right opposite, which is the seven o'clock position. The, hold, the needle holder must be parallel to the suture line. This is the suture line. It must be parallel to the suture line. And all these steps, I won't go into the details. What we take for granted in open surgery has to be deliberate movements, like orchestrated steps of a dance. Each one of these, loading the needle, deflecting it to get it perpendicular, driving the needle, the bite and the exit point, the knot tying, every single thing is to be deliberately done. That's the only way you can do it. And to do that, you need to have the two instruments, your needle holder and the grasper on the other side, at a meeting at an angle of 60 to 90 degrees. If they're parallel to each other, it won't work. If they're too obtuse like that, it won't work. So you need to have a comfortable 60 to 90 degree angle before you can effect suturing. And the thread should not be too long, you know, in contrast to your extra corporeal knotting where you need to have a 10 to 12 inch long thread because the thread has to go in from the outside, go around the, the viscous or the tube and come out and then you do everything on the outside and push it back in, which means that you need a long thread. Whereas if you have a long thread in an intracorporeal suturing or knotting, you end up with too many loops inside. You wouldn't know where the tail of the thread is. And so you can get into a bit of a mess if you have a very long thread inside. 
The other trick you need to understand is that you must put all threads through a reducer. If you put it right, if you put it in directly through your trocar, you know these valves on the in the trocar. You have either a trumpet valve or a flap valve. The flap valve can damage the thread and make it very very weak. So if you want it to go through the reducer, you can't have a very big needle. Okay, this is again a typo here. My apologies. It's a 30 mm needle. Most of the time you use a 25 or 30 mm needle going through the reducer. Sometimes you can have a straight needle, a long one, and put it right into the abdomen through the abdominal wall itself without going through a trocar. But those are um, exceptions. Okay, let's now come back into the uh, the uh, instrument part you know i was telling you about the practicalities of doing the actual laparoscopic surgery until now uh, let us get into the uh, the instrument part again uh, let me ask kiran are you there can you unmute yourself please all right i don't know if he's there all right can i ask abhipsa to unmute They're not. And Tushar, I'll have to get back to you. Yes, sir. I think you're my only victim today. All right. So <laughs> why do you think you need an insufflator? Sir, to create a new peritoneum, to create a space to work, sir. All right. But why do you need an insufflator? Why don't you pump some air into the abdomen? Uh, it is dynamic, sir, which uh, maintains the constant uh, amount of air. Mm -hmm. For you to keep the space. Yes, it's a dynamic process. So doing it mechanically will be a problem. Are there any other advantages of an insufflator? What happens uh, to the intra-abdominal pressure if you over-inflate? Yes, sir. Compartment. Abdominal compartment. Yeah, you mean it puts pressure on the IVC and you, can, you may have a very sharp reduction in the, in the venous return and you may even have a cardiovascular collapse. So it's important to make sure that we have a hold on the intra-abdominal pressure. So it's a constant balance between the intra-abdominal pressure and the space. And you must work with the lowest abdominal pressure that is compatible with adequate space. Okay. Does it do anything else, the insufflator? Not all insufflators do it, but some of them. They can warm the gas. Yes, sir. So instead of if you put a lot of cold air, cold carbon dioxide inside, oh, at the end of a three, four hour operation, you may end up with hypothermia. So you can have a warm gas. So you need to have an intra-abdominal pressure sensor that makes sure that you do not, you do not exceed a given pressure. 12 to 14 millimeters is usually the pressure. The insufflation must be commensurate with the leak. If you're doing a big, big operation with five or six ports, the leak will be higher. You can't keep on pumping to keep it up. So you need to have many insufflators have a maximum of 20. Uh, liters per minute, but there are some with 40 liters per minute as well. And so you need to have that kind of uh, good pumping that's required. It must be a variable rate depending on the intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, and, and it's important that you need to have alarms and some dials to show you what's happening. From time to time, you must be looking at it. If you find that the pressure is going up, definitely you must have an alarm. You can have a filter for the gas. Doing it just from by hand, you won't have a filter. You can warm the gas. So these are the advantages of an insufflator. This is the classical picture of an insufflator that we use. All right. It's, you can set the rate of flow. You can set the intra-abdominal pressure that you want. And this will tell you at the end of the operation, the total amount of gas that has been put in. Okay. What should be the rate of insufflation and what should be the intra-abdominal pressure? You see, the various needle is a very small caliber. So even if you reset it at 20 liters per minute, it won't take it. The maximum you can have is 2 to 3 liters per minute. And trocar, it's up to the maximum that the, uh, that the uh, insufflator can give. As I said, generally it is 20 and it can be as high as 40. And it is leak dependent. You must work with the smallest possible pressure. That gives you comfort. It's been shown. I won't go into the details, but the higher the pressure, 
I'm not talking about dangerous pressure of 20, 25, which may you know, impede the venous return, but I'm talking about even 15 or 16. Um, the patient will have uh, adverse effects in the long run. And so it's good to work with 12 or 14. And in the pediatric age group, it's more like 10 millimeters of mercury. Okay. As I told you, the lower the pressure, you will have less pain and it will have less effect on splanting circulation and it has no effect on intrathoracic or intracranial pressure. That is, that is important. It's not going to make a big difference. And some people talk about tumor dissemination, but no, you know, we don't have any data on whether it is better to use uh, lower pressures in cancer cases. Now, we switch to the telescope. And uh, again, I can. Who, does anybody want to volunteer other than Tushar to tell me the principle of a telescope in a laparoscopy case? Anojan, are you there? Can do you want to talk? Vijay. Are you guys there? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. We can hear you. Okay. Tell me. So what is, telescope what is can be a zero degree, 30 degree, or 45 degree like that, sir. All right. What is the principle? Op optical illumination, sir. Mainly the optical fibers which enter into the camera. Is, and, it, uh, is it fibers in laparoscopy? That is true of flexible endoscope, but in a laparoscope, is it optical fibers? Mm, I'm not very sure, sir. Not sure. Anybody else? Okay. It's a stuff called Hopkins rod lens system. It's a solid cylinder of glass. Okay. It's not the fiber that you have. That is why you cannot have flexible. Uh, you know, there are exceptions. There are different fiber things in laparoscopy, but we hardly ever use it. But the standard telescope that we use is a rigid telescope. All right. And it has got solid drench system, solid glass like this. And if you want to bend the light either from here to there, you know, at this end or this end, for example, if you want to make it a 30 degree or a 45 degree that you rightly mentioned, then you have to use prisms to bend the light. But it is not the fiber optics that you use in flexible endoscope. Can you see this? This is a 30, 45 degree and 30 degree. Uh, what does it mean to you? How does it? You know, this 0, 30, 45, what does it actually mean to you? Krishna Rao, again. Oh, so, 0 degree camera, the side will show uh, st only straight. straight sir. We, have to, we right. have to change the angle to show the cameraman has to change the camera's uh, direction to visualize one part. Okay. Okay. So 30 degree and 45 degrees, they're angulated so that the direct that we can just rotate the uh, camera from the outside at the hub. Yes. Yeah. That it will uh, illuminate. So that it will be usually the other way. If you want to show the right side, you have to turn the right left side like Correct. that. See the zero degree, you're looking straight on. Rotating the camera makes no difference. Still looking straight on. If you want to go right, you know, if you want to look up, you've got to put the camera down, the telescope down. Uh, and if you want to look down, you've got to lift it up. But here in 30 degrees or so, you can keep the, the direction of the telescope as it is. But if you rotate the camera such a way that the wedge is looking downwards, you look 30 degree downwards. And if you rotate it 180 degrees, you'll be looking 30 degree upwards. Where would you use it? How is it advantageous to have 30 degrees as against a zero degree? Sir, the camera person will be at ease. He need not to lift up the whole cameras. Yeah, yeah. And there are, to show there are two advantages. One of them is if you have a crevice, you know, a deep, you can say hepatorenal recess, for example, or at the OG junction or deep in the pelvis at the vaginal vault or whatever, then you, however much you lift the camera, you will not be able to see the crevice. So it's good to have a 30 degree or even a 45 looking down. That's one. The second thing is if you have this camera lifted in funny angles when you're working, it, the camera person can actually interfere with the surgeon's two hands because of these odd positions. So if you want more space and freedom for the surgeon to work comfortably, then you need to use 
a different an angled telescope so that the surgeon is comfortable and the cameraman's hand is far away so depending on only 30 degrees is very difficult I mean, only only 0 degree is very difficult it's always good to have 30 degrees and if you're doing a lot of bariatric work and you know working at the at the OG junction for example or deep in the pelvis you may even need a 45 okay and what is the principle governing the video camera you attach the, the telescope transmit the image through the solid hopkins rod lens system but you need to see it somewhere through the video the video camera is attached to the telescope so what is the principle governing the video camera vijay you want to have a go at it tushar are you there uh, sir uh... It, it projects direct image, sir, instead of uh, inverted what is the image. principle? Again, I'm talking about a principle. What is um, it that senses the image? Have you heard no. of what's called a charged coupled device? Uh, no, sir, sir. Anybody else? Krishna Rao, you want to have a go? Sir, uh, sir, I don't have a clue, sir. Charged, right. uh, this I have heard, sir, but I'm not very sure what it is. A charged coupled device is a device with lots of little cells like this. Okay, when light falls on it, it releases an electron. It's as simple as that. That's the property of that device. It is like the individual component of a fly's eye, for example. It has all these little, little things. Thousands of those form the eye of an eye of, of a fly, for example. Similarly, you have thousands of these. These are called each one of them is responsible for a pixel, a dot. And so what it does is when light falls on it, it releases an electron. And the, and the release of these electrons are detected by the circuit board of the camera. And it puts out an image. And the, all the colors that we have in the universe can be split into only three, red, green, and blue, RGB. Okay? And so if you have uh, as what's called a single chip camera, the number of pixels in it are divided one third each to read the red, the green, and the blue signals. That's a single chip camera. In a three chip camera, for each of these primary colors, as they're called, the red, the green, and the blue, you have a separate chip. The advantage of a three chip camera is that if you have blood, for example, single chip camera gives you a tremendously less clear image whereas a three chip camera because it has three separate chips for the three separate primary colors continues to give you a reasonably good vision so most standard cameras now in use in laparoscopy for the last 10 10 or 15 years is three chip cameras now the same thing can have various just like in your tv if you are a tv enthusiast you will know about the definition okay standard definition high definition, we talk about 4K and things like that. I won't go into the details, but generally we use a 16 by nine uh, ratio. Four by three is the other thing that people talk about. You need to have 19, 20 by 1080 pixels. This is HD. 4K is even more now. Some of them are 4K cameras. And this is the way it scans, progressive and interlaced scanning. It is the way it scans for these uh, images. And you now have 3D cameras, built-in 3D cameras, which give you a sense of depth of vision. And there are specialized cameras for fluorescence imaging and all that. This is done for diagnosing cancer, diagnosing um, dyes and detecting anatomical uh, tissues like the ureter and the CBD and all that. It's not important to go into these details. These are the, the, uh, the newer uh, techniques that are available. But it's important for you to know that nowadays we go with a high definition three chip camera as a standard for uh, laparoscopy. Now you must understand one basic thing in laparoscopy and that is that your, your telescope must be an HD telescope. If you want HD image, you can't use, there are less resolution, you know, telescopes with resolution, less resolutions, and you can't use one with a less resolution with a fancy camera. It won't read it because the telescope doesn't read anything which is good enough. So you must have a good HD telescope, a good HD camera, and the monitor has to match it as well. 
and the connection between the camera and the monitor must also match. So the important thing here I want to stress is that whenever it, you won't do it as a graduate, when you become a surgeon, think that you must understand that you have to have matching for all these things before you can get a good image. This becomes important when you know administrators take your advice as a surgeon, for example, as a laparoscopic surgeon to choose the cameras and the equipment that they want. Okay. Now, this is a lot more practical and useful even for undergraduates because it deals with common sense. It's not something which is very specialized. What do you think would be special about hand instruments? Krishna Rao. Sir, uh, hand instruments, there are... Compared to open surgery, surgery you know, that's, that's, it, that's yes. the context. Yeah. Uh, so we have Maryland and Bobel Gasper and no, Gasper. What, like tell me, you know, I'm all I'm always focusing on instruments. You know, what are what is different in laparoscopic instruments compared to open surgery instruments? Sir, uh, a blade will be very short, uh, short length, sir. Uh -huh. And uh, range of movement is in the hand that is rotatable. Some of the instruments that we can uh, first tip first can be point rotatable. is it is rotatable, correct? Yes. All right. And also very long instruments, but the tip is very short. The instrument is long, correct? All right. So, and uh, instruments are attachable with the cartilage, sir. Sorry. Some of the instruments. Say that again. Some of the, some of the instruments we can attach a cartilage. They so are insulated. Most insulated. of them. Most of the instruments are insulated. Correct. Very good. Yeah. And yes, the and, and they are having a cold at the backside, and uh, we will operate from outside, and the movement will happen inside. It's that that, that means intel corrected. With a long, long tunnel. Uh, yeah, instead. talking about fulcrum effect and the paradoxical movement. Yeah, we have covered it in the last one. But looking at the design of the instrument itself, all right, they are long. As you mentioned, there is always an insulation for that. And the grip is never very big. It's never as sturdy as your open instruments. They're delicate and they can break quickly. But what is important is that the grip that you use on the outside has to be has to be what's called a thinner grip because you need to support one of the limbs you know if you have a a double thing like this this fellow will be supported against your thinner eminence so you find that most of the instruments will have what is called the thinner grip uh, or the cushery grip on the on the uh, handle part of it if you don't have it then you come up with a lot of uh, a lot of fatigue. All right. I won't go into the details. I think I'll just skip this. One important thing I have to say, it's, it's equally applicable to the open instruments also. When you loop your fingers into the holes in the grip, make sure that you don't go beyond the first interphalangeal joint. If you put the whole of the finger into the hole, then your efficiency will come down like mad. So it's important for you to have only uh, you know, these grips in your handle at the distal interphalangeal joint. Okay. What about the OT? Would you would you think the the philosophy again? I'm talking only principles and philosophy. The philosophy of the OT setup in laparoscopy will be different from that of open surgery. Tushar, you want to have a go? Lighting, sir. Okay. Lighting, what is special about it? You will have a separate laparoscopic light, right? Uh, we tend to switch off the other lights, sir. Correct. Correct. Uh, what has it got to do with the OT setup? Uh, Nothing very specific. Now, compare to, compare to an open surgery theater, and nowadays, all theaters are compatible for both, but compared to the earlier OT theater for open surgery, what do you think is the volume of equipment in laparoscopic surgery? Uh, we have a separate laparoscopic tower, sir. It's a lot more, right? You're yes. using a lot more instruments. You have a separate laparoscopic tower. You have an, in, you know, uh, we talked about so many other energy sources, which means you have a lot more equipment in a laparoscopic OT which means that it has to be bigger yes, than an average. You know, you could make do with a small operation theater for open surgery, but not so for laparoscopy. 
also you talked about towers and you, you know what pendants are uh, uh, it is a central instrument uh, sorry it is a central uh, uh, where we get all uh, connections sir for uh, oxygen yeah, what, see, that's true not necessarily see pendants can can carry different things an anesthetic pendant which holds an anesthetic machine we'll have all these oxygen wires and other you know monitors and things like that but understand that a pendant per se is is a contraption that is hung from the roof and it can take several instruments and there are kinds of shelves where several things can be kept in it why should it be hung from the roof why can't you have a lot of trolleys on the floor uh, easier to move around more than ease of use ease of movement you can't clean the ot you will have so many trolleys so many things and crevices underneath so to clean your ot you need to have the floor to be completely free so everything must be hung from the roof and all the wiring and the tubing that you have must all be in the roof if they are all on the floor and and you know spread all over the operation theater floor then you will be tripping over these instruments and you can never clean the ot so the concept of pendant is to make sure that you can accommodate a lot of equipment with no hindrance either for cleaning on the floor or any of the tubing and the wiring that goes with it okay why did i even talk about the pendant just like the area the floor area of the ot should be high if you have something coming down from the roof what should be high the roof itself must be high okay because if you have a, a low roof then the pendant will not be able to give you enough gap between the the bottom end of the of the pendant and the floor so in terms of the physical building you know physical structure you need to have a 30 by 20 feet with a 15 15 feet ceiling and all these wirings must be this is a pendant as you can see all this wiring must be pre done it, it should all be pendant based the other important thing about the pendant is you know they have these arms here horizontal arms and a vertical arm it can move all around this movement is extremely important why do you think this movement is important to place it uh, conveniently sir wherever we want to yeah but i am talking about a 360 degree movement why would i need it not sure sir. not sure okay the point is that in laparoscopy you can be standing at the foot end of the table depending on what operation you do you can be standing at the head end of the table you can be standing to the patient's right or the patient's left as a surgeon and so yes. you need a, you need a minimum of two two monitors because the the assistant who is you no know, let us say you are standing to the left of the patient the monitor is in front of you so the monitor is to the right of the patient okay so i am standing here okay my assistant is and you can see that the nurse is on that side now the nurse or your assistant must also be seeing what you are doing to help you properly which means that behind this surgeon there must be a slave monitor a second monitor so that the assistant and the nurse can actually see what's happening so you need to have two monitors and they have to be 360 degrees rotatable because now this patient you now the surgeon is standing to the left of the patient so the monitor is to the right what if you're standing between the legs of the patient this monitor has to come here okay where the anesthetist is if the patient is standing next to the anesthetist at the head end of the table to do a pelvic operation this monitor has to go there to the foot end of the table so you understand that these pendants and their movements have to be so versatile that everything goes all round that is the principle of uh, ot and this is what it is okay rotatable pendants rotatable lights multiple monitors this is of course a fancy ot we don't have these fancy ot's here you can see so many monitors we have two and that is a basic minimum and if you have so many equipment it's the best to have a central console where your operation theater assistant can help you with managing all these okay my final aspect 
of the talk for this evening uh, is ergonomics. What does ergonomics mean to you, Krishna Rao? Uh, sir, uh, uh, proper orientation of the surgeon and the assistant and the proper placement of the ports for ease of the movements at, mm -hmm. and uh, proper angulation. Mm -hmm. but, uh, as you told, sir, so about 60 to 90 degree should be there for a, between a ports and it should perform a triangulation. All right. To make right, right. An, that is a, that is a part of ergonomics. But what is yes, it sir. meant for? What does it actually mean? Why do you want to focus on ergonomics? in laparoscopy sir, more uh, than anything else good ergonomics should be faster surgery sir so if faster the surgeon is struggling if the surgeon is struggling it will take a long time uh, yeah. and uh, tiring also yeah, and uh, that, both, that is the main thing in industry it is clearly known that if you don't have if you don't have ergonomics in practice in anything you know manufacturing industry in healthcare wherever you will find that the patient or, or the, sorry the, the worker the surgeon is a worker in that sense, will end up with fatigue and yes, body ache, body ache and various problems, eye strain and things like that, so that his efficiency drops down drastically. Okay. So yes, in it, it's a Greek term, which again means ergon means work and nomos means arrangement. So you need to have a proper arrangement of not just the patient and the and the ports of the whole operation theater complex. Okay, equipment design, workplace layout, everything to improve productivity, reduce fatigue and promote safety. It involves various aspects like the OT design, the instrument design, I told you about the thinner grip. If you don't have it, then you can get a lot of fatigue in the, in the hands, you can get cramps in your hands. And as you rightly said, ports placement, and the surgeon's uh, standing and his position and things like this. And just to give you uh, a little bird's view, you know, it's a whole topic by itself. You must understand that you must have a relaxed stance with the feet slightly apart, no tilt in the pelvis. Your monitor must be at the level of your eye and not high above there. You should not be extending your leg, your neck. And your patient must be a little below your elbow level. So that this angle, the angle between the forearm and the arm must be an obtuse angle. It should not be an acute angle. If it is lifted up like this, you will end up with shoulder and neck strain. With an arrangement like this, you will get uh, a neck strain again. And so it's important that when we set up the OT, when we set up the instruments for each of our operations, as surgeons and as a surgical team, we have to focus on the ergonomics. I will stop here and uh, leave it open for uh, questions. Uh, if there are any questions on the YouTube or whatever, somebody will have to uh, pose those questions to me because I have no access to those. Sir, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Sir, how good are the articulating instruments, sir, uh, with the multiple joints uh, which uh, which have come into the market? Yeah. See, they're pretty good. Uh, but you must understand that the more joints are more flexible they are, or more versatile they are, the weaker they are. And that is a fact of life. But the instrument design is so good now that even with multiple articulating joints, uh, things work quite well. But one of the practical limitations of these is the limitation in the grip. Classically, if you have just biliary, I'm giving an example, commonest example, a biliary colic with a thin walled gallbladder, most of these instruments hold it very well. But if you have an acutely inflamed thick gallbladder, which is friable, for example, you, you won't get a grip that you really need. And if you use some other instrument which is stronger, then you make a hole in the gallbladder. That's always a constant struggle we have. But by and large, these instruments are okay. But you must understand that they are less sturdy and more prone to damage and uh, attrition compared to open surgery instruments.
Okay, if there are no more questions, with your permission, Vijay, I will uh, call a halt to this meeting. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank uh, you so much, sir. Yeah. It was a very Thank useful uh, session for all of us. All right. Yeah. Thank you for your valuable Thank you. time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you.